I've, oops. <laughs> okay, I believe we are live. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. We're uh, no doubt gonna have some more people uh, joining tonight as well. Um, I'm Carla Bruni. I work with the Chicago Bungalow Association as their um, preservation and resiliency specialist. Uh, just a few announcements before I launch into um, Tanika and what she'll be talking about tonight and a little bit about her. Um, just so you guys know, many of you have uh, taken advantage of our energy savers program where we do air sealing and insulating. Um, we've, we've shut that down for a while. We've probably called you if you were on our list already, um, but we've shut that down. And, uh, you know, for a few months dealing with COVID and getting, um, you know, updates on everything that's going on, waiting for the phases to progress. And we have a slew of new safety techniques and equipment and everything that will be um, implementing now. We've just started back for the last um, the, the last week or so. We've been getting back out to homes and are doing a slow rollout again. Um, so if you have questions about that, don't hesitate to call us. Um, we are back at it. Um, our August webinars are going to be posted soon if they aren't already. Uh, so you can check those out on our website. Otherwise, you'll be getting an email alert about them if you're on our, our eblast list. So keep your eyes out. Um, we're going to be doing a Facebook Live of this stream as well. Uh, so you can also watch that way. I'm not sure why you would jump off Zoom personally, but if you're on Facebook Live, hello. Um, thank you guys for watching. Uh, in terms of Q&A tonight, please use the, at the bottom you'll see a Q&A tab to the right if you hover over at the bottom of your screen. Um, definitely use that, do not use the chat function. And we're gonna let Tanika just, you know, go through her whole presentation and explain, you know, everything she's been up to before we do any of that Q&A. Um, I'm probably gonna, uh, you know, turn off my video so I don't have to look at myself for the next hour uh, <laughs> when Tanika's speaking. But I'll hop back on at the end and I'll um, facilitate those questions. We're probably not gonna get to all of them because, you know, we have to stay within a certain time limit, but um, we'll get through as much as we can and you can, um, certainly follow along with Tanika's projects and what she's up to after this as well. So um, most likely your questions will be answered in one way or another. Um, but I think that's all of uh, all the basic announcements I have. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Tanika Johnson. I just want to tell you a little bit about her before we uh, let her launch in. Uh, Tanika Lewis Johnson is a photographer and a visual artist and a lifelong resident of Chicago's Southside neighborhood of Inglewood. In 2010, she helped co-found the Resident Association of Greater Ingle Inglewood, also known as RAGE, uh, whose mission is to mobilize people and resources to force positive change in Inglewood through solution-based approaches. Uh, within her artistic practice, Tanika often explores urban segregation and documents the, nu the nuance and richness of the Black community. As a trained photojournalist and teaching artist, she's been engaged in building an artistic legacy that gained citywide recognition over the last couple of years. She was featured in Chicago Magazine as 2017 Chicagoan of the Year for her photography of Inglewood's everyday beauty, countering its pervasive media coverage of poverty and crime. Her Inglewood-based photography projects from the inside and everyday rituals were exhibited at Rootwork Gallery in Pilsen, the Chicago Cultural Center, the Harold Washington Library Center, and at the Loyola University Museum of Art. Her current ongoing project, Folded Map, which is what we'll hear about tonight, visually investigates disparities among Chicago's residents while bringing them, while bringing them together to have conversation. It was also exhibited at Luma last year, which I got to see, which was amazing. Uh, she transformed this project into an advocacy and poly, policy influencing tool that invites audiences to open a dialogue and question how we're all socially impacted by racial and institutional conditions that segregate the city. In 2019, she was named the Field Foundation's leader for a new Chicago. And most recently, she was appointed as a member of the Cultural Advisory Council of the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events by the City of Chicago Council. Um, Tanika is amazing. I've seen her speak multiple times. I never get tired of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, her projects are often interactive most of the, uh, much of the time. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to hear about uh, what you've been up to. So without further ado, if you want to share your screen, Tanika, feel free. Hi. I am sharing my screen now. Sorry for. And OK, I'm going to go into presentation view. And Carl, if you could just give me a thumbs up. I just want to make sure 
that everyone can see everything okay. Uh, it looks good to me. Nothing is obstructing the view. No, no, it's just a full screen of, uh, of what your screen is seeing. Okay, perfect. Uh, I do want to switch. Oh, one thing before I do start, I want to go into a different view. Okay. All right, thank you for dealing with the adjustment to Zoom presentations. Um, today I'm going to talk to you all about Folded Map. And before I start to tell you about Folded Map and the project itself, I want to guide you through how it actually started. And before I do that, I want you all to consider this question for yourself. Um, how did you come to live in your neighborhood? What influenced your decision? Who did you talk to? And did you look up statistics? How many neighborhoods did you visit? I would like for you to think about that question as I let you know how I came to live and grow up in Inglewood and eventually create the Folded Map Project. It all started with my grandmother, Marilyn G. Tenney. She came from down south to Chicago in 1962. And she wanted to come to Chicago to pursue a better life, to have more opportunities. She was a part of many African Americans who came from down south to the north in pursuit of a better life because of the racism and discrimination they were facing. And honestly, she was an artist. She was very good at painting, but that didn't serve her where she was living. And it wasn't something that would serve her well when she even moved to Chicago. So she decided to come to Chicago so she could get what older black folks would call a good government job. <laughs> And when she came to Chicago, she actually found a good government job. She worked at the social security office, the local social security office as an administrative assistant. And she worked that job for seven years, saving all of her income so that she could purchase the building that I would eventually grow up in. The building is 62nd, is on 62nd in Loomis, in Inglewood. It's the building that you see right behind that little red car. This block was where my entire childhood was spent. My first friends of life I met on this block. My grandmother's best friend, Miss Patterson, she lived on this block right next door. They had the same migration story. But Miss Patterson, she used to cook for everyone on the block. People would buy her her dinner plates for $5. She would even sell homemade ice cream to the kids every summer for 25 cents. I didn't even know you could make homemade ice cream until Miss Patterson started making it. And then also, this block was such a family knit block so close to each other. It was the kind of block where everyone knew each other's business. All the kids would be outside playing every day, all day. Someone, an adult, could send any kid to the store. This block was so close that my mother's bully from high school lived two doors down, and they were both pregnant at the same time. And they would both have children and their children will become best friends. So I am best friends with the child of my mother's bully. <laughs> this is how close the block was. And it was actually, I was living on this block when I started high school. I went to Lane Tech High School, which is on Addison and Western, 15 miles north of Inglewood. I would have to 
walk down the street on this block and go to the bus stop on 63rd Street and make it to the bus stop no later than 5.45 in the morning just to get to school on time by eight. So this is my daily commute to high school. It included this long journey. I would often take the bus to the Red Line train on 63rd Street and then 63rd Street to Addison and then Addison bus to Western. And it was on this commute that essentially my world would open up and change. This little 13 year old black girl was going to have to take the train every day early in the morning to a neighborhood that she was completely new to. And it was on this train ride that I learned so much about how different my neighborhood looked from many neighborhoods that I would pass through on the train. So mind you, this is 1993 when I started high school. And since you all are homeowners, I know that you all are older, but I must say this, because this is what I tell a lot of my younger audiences, that this was 1993. So there was definitely no cell phones at all, okay? So in order for you to know where you were going, you had to know Chicago's grid map system. You had to know that what an address meant. It gave you information about how far west, how far north. And so most teenagers who were commuting in the 90s, if not all, we were very well aware of Chicago's grid map system. And so it was on this train ride that I started to recognize that streets that existed in Inglewood went so far north. I didn't even know they went this far north. Streets like Polina, Walcott, Ashland, Western, Halsted. I started to learn how far north these streets actually extended. But more importantly, I started to look out the train and notice that, wow, the neighborhood that Lane Tech is in doesn't have vacant lots. And the neighborhood that I live in does. I noticed that my neighborhood had so many storefront churches to the point that it made me question why, because I realized that Lane Tech, the neighborhood that Lane Tech was in, didn't have any storefront churches. One of the other things I immediately noticed was the neighborhood Lane Tech was in didn't have one of my favorite things, which was beauty supply stores. We had so many in Inglewood. We also had a lot of fast food restaurants that I would often buy my medium bag of french fries with extra mild sauce and salt and pepper. I wasn't able to order that in the neighborhood that Lane Tech was in because they didn't have fast food restaurants in abundance like Inglewood. They had cafes and sit down restaurants. And what bothered me the most is that after school, I would often go to those cafes around Lane Tech. And I realized Inglewood doesn't have any cafes. And this just disturbed me because I just didn't understand why. I didn't know why. And then also there was the observation that we all have probably experienced, which on the train, by the time that I would get to Cermak, I noticed that the train would change racially, that the people on the train, it wouldn't be as many black people going too far beyond downtown and up north. And by the time that I got to Addison, I was often one of few black people still on the train. And so all of these things just stuck with me. But the real fun began when I started high school. This was where I would be opened up to the diversity of Chicago. If you all don't know, Lane Tech has the largest student body in Chicago's public school system. They have a little bit over 4,000 students. It is literally like a small college campus. And in the 90s, 
Lane Tech was able to curate the racial demographic of their student body to reflect the racial demographic of Chicago. So they had equal percentage of white, black, Latino, and Asian. Unfortunately now, schools can't use race um, as a criteria to, you can't use race as a criteria because of a federal law that passed saying that was not right. So in the 90s, I was able to experience diversity that was beyond anything I would ever experience later in my life. It was at school that the real fun began. I met so many kids from different nationalities, races, different parts of Chicago that honestly were really reflections of me. This was the time that I met my first group of Latino friends who were from neighborhoods I had never heard of, like Humboldt Park and Wicker Park. Not the Wicker Park today, but the Wicker Park of the 90s. And those were the friends that helped me understand the cultural difference beyond just being geographically different of being Mexican and Puerto Rican. My Latino friends made sure I did not confuse the two. They said, we're gonna teach you what the difference is and you better remember. Then I also met friends who I assumed were Puerto Rican or Mexican, but they were Guatemalan. I also had a new group of friends who I thought were black, like me, but they were actually first generation from immigrant families and they lived on the far north side and they were from places like Panama, Belize, Jamaica, places I had only heard about in, in, in conversations in some countries I had never even heard of at all. I didn't even know about Belize or Panama. And I was like, they have black people there? <laughs> and then I had friends, my white friends like Steve Jakevich. We talked every day about hip hop in our algebra class. And he was the first Polish name that I ever said out of my mouth on a regular basis, Steve Jakevich. And we were very close. And then I had my friends who were Asian, who very quickly told me, all of us are not Chinese, okay? Some of us are Korean, some of us are even Indian. Yes, that's Asian too. Then I also had my friends who were Filipino, who I often mistook as being Latino because of their last names. And I learned, not, in, not from a teacher, but through my friendships. They told me, no, I'm not Latino, I'm Filipino. Our last names are this because of colonization. I was like, oh, wow, okay. And then I have my friends who were black like me, but from a whole nother part of the city called the West Side. I had no idea what the West Side was. I was like, what is the West Side? And they would joke and say, it's from Cicero to Laramie and Laramie on down. I was so surprised. I said, it's streets after Cicero? <laughs> this is what we did every day for four years. We would ask each other's questions about um, where we lived, what parties we went to, until we start actually visiting each other all over Chicago, going to a variety of hip hop parties because it was so abundant in the 90s. And this is how we got to know each other's neighborhoods, regardless of anything that was said on the news. We visited each other. We hung out with each other. We did this every day for four years to the point where by the time we were seniors in high school, you could literally have a young black boy from the West Side tell you that his favorite Filipino dish is pancit. We were literally immersed in culture and it just became normal to us. And so it was this time that I realized, wow, Chicago has so many different neighborhoods and it's segregated. We realized that during the course of our time in high school, but we didn't know 
to the extent it really was until we got older. This is what Chicago segregation looks like. This map that you see here, it says 2017, but it actually hasn't changed since my grandmother got here. Chicago segregation has been so clear cut since the 60s and even earlier than that. What you're looking at here, the races are represented by these different colors. And before I tell you what each color means, I want you to think about if Chicago's ref segregation reflects how we want to interact with each other today. And if it doesn't, then I want you to think about what could help it change since legislation and policies haven't done anything. The purplish pink that you see, those are the neighborhoods that are predominantly white. The turquoise bluish that you see, those are the neighborhoods that are predominantly black. The orangish that you see, those are the neighborhoods that are predominantly Latino. And then the neon green that you see in the center are the neighborhoods that are predominantly Asian. So obviously the center, that's Chinatown. And then you see some, some of those green speckled throughout the top amongst the purplish pink. Chicago is the most segregated city in our country. And the reason it's the most segregated in our country is because the segregation has not shifted in many decades. It's actually only grown. We've been segregated the same way for decades now. And so what I had come to realize about my commute to high school is that I wasn't just noticing differences between my neighborhood and the neighborhood that Lane Tech was in. I was actually riding through Chicago segregation. So I had to get older to realize the relationship between race, geography, and our city's investment in those neighborhoods. So fast forward, I graduate high school. I go to Columbia College majoring in journalism and photography, still having close ties to my friends in high school. And then I meet the love of my life at that time. And we get married and have these kids that you see here. And my then husband was also from Inglewood and he had a similar experience of Chicago, going to different neighborhoods, to hip hop parties. So once we got married and had our children and we were, you know, in our 20s, very young, you know, our families encouraged us to think about getting a house. And you all are homeowners, so you know about that process. So we were definitely naive to what we were about to get into. We actually thought we could live anywhere in Chicago. We figured we have friends in all of these neighborhoods. We can just go live in whatever neighborhood we want. And so we pursued looking for a home with that in mind. And as you can guess, with our little 120,000, 135,000 housing budget, we couldn't find anything in none of the other neighborhoods that we could afford. So, we decided, let's just go back to Inglewood. We know that we can afford a home in Inglewood. We know the blocks that we can live on. And at the end of the day, it's home. So we purchased our home in Inglewood and started our life as young homeowners, parents, and a married couple. And so, Going back to your neighborhood that you grew up in as an adult and a homeowner is very different. 
you start to pay attention to things that you didn't even think of when you were a child. I started to pay attention to schools because I had children. And I unfortunately learned about the low ratings that majority of the schools in Inglewood had. And another thing that I found out was this map that you see before you here. This is the aldermatic map of Greater Inglewood. Inside the turquoise lines, you have Inglewood and West Inglewood. Those two neighborhoods together make up Greater Inglewood. Most Inglewood residents do not differentiate between those two neighborhoods. We call all of it Inglewood. But for the purpose of this conversation, I will say Greater Inglewood. Now, normally if this were an in-person presentation, I would ask you all to tell me how many colors you see within the turquoise lines. So I'm just gonna give you a minute to figure out how many, and maybe you could put it in the chat. How many colors do you see inside of the turquoise lines? So while you all are thinking about that, I am just going to tell you. There's six, okay? If you count this little yellowish, greenish in the corner, that's six. But overall, Inglewood has five aldermen, five aldermatic wards. No other neighborhood in Chicago has that many aldermen. And we've had five aldermen for a long time, definitely in most of my adult life. So as you can also see, the colors extend outside of Inglewood. So the pink that you see, which is my aldermatic ward where I live, is six. Majority of the sixth ward is outside of Inglewood. Majority of the 17th ward is outside of Inglewood. Majority of the 20th ward is outside of Inglewood. And the only ward that actually has a significant representation in Inglewood is 16. But as you can see, this line here, that's actually 63rd Street. So you can literally ride from 63rd Street and the Dan Ryan to 63rd and Western, and you can drive through four different wards. Sometimes you're in two different wards just crossing the street. And so I had my dear friend, Aisha Butler, who is one of the co-founders of Resident Association of Greater Inglewood, explain to me how this was problematic. And as a homeowner, a young homeowner, I was learning all of this. So if residents wanted to come together and build a 63rd Street business corridor, we would have to get together and hope that four aldermen would agree. And so therein lies the other layer of segregation in Inglewood, the aldermatic ward segregation. And so it was because of this new information, I realized that when you segregate people, it's easier to discriminate against them. And this is something, and this is really the reason that the Resident Association of Greater Inglewood even started. We started Resident Association of Greater Inglewood in 2010. It was the brainchild of my dear friend, Aisha Butler. She wanted all of the residents, regardless of their wards in Inglewood, to be able to come together, much like you all do with the Bungalow Association, and share information, get information about city resources, get information about programs, 
uh, that are targeting Inglewood residents that they can take advantage of. Because obviously Inglewood residents can't rely on the news to get that kind of information. And having so many aldermen, you have to go to each alderman's office and hope that the information is, to, is the same. So we started to have regular meetings where we shared this information. And we started with having meetings with only about 30 people. And now it's close to 200 every other month. And once I started to really understand the depth of what my neighborhood was struggling with, even though my childhood and, and so many friends and families that I know in Inglewood um, didn't have an experience, a negative experience living in Inglewood, despite what people think, um, I knew that my neighborhood was going to potentially have schools that were gonna close. I knew that our home ownership was about 25%. I knew that we had lost the most vibrant business corridor we had, which was 63rd and Halsted. That had left in my childhood. And I knew we were struggling with gun violence. It is definitely not as rampant as people have been made to believe. Inglewood itself, Greater Inglewood, is a huge community. Those two neighborhoods together, Inglewood and West Inglewood, is over six square miles. It's the third largest neighborhood in Chicago. So you can have places within Inglewood that are hot spots for gun violence. And the majority of Inglewood is not experiencing that. And so because of all of these things, I wanted to understand, how did my neighborhood get this way? What happened? And then I discovered this. What you're looking at here is a map of Greater Inglewood. The red dots that you see represent all of the homes in Inglewood that were purchased on land sale contracts or sold on land sale contracts. And if you don't know what land sale contracts are, I'm going to show you a clip, an excerpt from a documentary called The Shame of Chicago that is currently still in production. Um, but it's an excerpt from an episode that is available that you can have access to to explain to you what land sale contracts are. But I want you to remember as you watch this clip that 80%, wouldn't you say that this is about 80% of the homes that were sold in the 50s and 60s to Black families were sold on land sale contracts. So if you can adjust your, your volume, I'm going to press start. And for the next few minutes, you're going to hear the excerpt from this documentary. This is really the origin in a modern sense of the racial wealth gap in the United States. And in order to understand that story of how African Americans continue to be at such a position of disadvantage relative to whites all through the 20th century into the 21st century, long after the legal reforms of the civil rights movement, to understand the perpetuation of that gap, we have to return back to this period and understand what were the mechanisms that put blacks at such disadvantages relative to whites. Like many Americans, Sally and Albert Bolton aspired to a home in the suburbs or a better neighborhood inside the city. But in the 1950s, those options weren't open to black families. So they made a down payment on a house in what was called Chicago's Black Belt. For two years, they met their monthly mortgage payments on time. Then one day, they received an eviction notice for being late. One time on one payment. That was when they went to see my mother. Mark Satter was an attorney who lived in the racially changing neighborhood, North Lawndale. What they asked of him was just to slow down the eviction. They said, you know, we only missed one payment. Like, we think we could pull this together. And if you could give us some time, you know, we could, we, we could keep it. Reviewing the Bolton's papers, 
Sutter was surprised to see that they had paid three times what the seller had paid for it. In fact, he explained to the Boltons, this isn't a mortgage, it's a rent-to-own installment contract. And the man who drew it up, Jay Garan, he's the real owner. After hearing this, they said oh, we were misled in, in, in too many ways, and we need, we, we want to sue him, and we want to stop this. As Sutter prepared his case, he learned that the Boltons were not alone. And he realizes that throughout the south and west sides of the city, there are brokers who control large numbers of property, and they're all selling on contract, and they're all selling at these huge markups. And he realizes this is horrifically dangerous. This was the way systems worked. It was a scheme by which uh, someone you know, could go into a community and take one house and effectively turn over and over and over and over again. You wanted to evict people. There was incentive to evict people. Evictions? Contracts? Why? Satter asked himself. What's happening here? Home ownership is the basis of a happy, contented family life. And now, through the use of a National Housing Act insured mortgage, is brought within the reach of all citizens on a monthly payment plan no greater than rent. And that's how it works. Say the price of the home you want to buy is $15,000. You make a down payment of $2,000, and the bank lends you the balance. Would you pay off at $110 a month for the next 25 years? Part of your payment goes for interest. That's what the bank charges for loaning you the money. The rest pays down your loan. That's your share of the house. With every monthly payment, your share of the house grows. That's called equity. What if you decide to move? You simply sell the house and keep your share. And if the house increases in value, you keep that too. This is how America's building its middle class, and individual families are building wealth, their financial nest eggs. I know, that's how I bought my house, but that's not how black people are treated. Let me show you. It starts with speculators, also called blockbusters. They go into a white neighborhood and knock on doors, telling white homeowners that the blacks are coming. The blacks are coming. Better sell now because the value of your house is going to drop if you don't. I can see your house is worth $15,000, but I'll give you $14,000. Scared, the white homeowner sells. Within days, the speculator hikes the price of the house and sells it to a black family for $27,000. The buyer makes a down payment of $2,000 and is obligated to make payments of $252 a month. So why would anyone buy a house with such a high markup? Because white-owned banks refuse to make loans to blacks, especially if they want to move into a white neighborhood. Desperate for a home and having no other options, they go to the speculator. The speculator draws up a contract. You think it's a mortgage, but it's not. A contract doesn't accrue equity until it's paid off in full. Not a, nothing, no equity. See, it's right there in the small print. Just check the box and sign your name to agree. So what if you want to move after living in the house for, say, 10 or 15 years? You lose everything. Remember, you don't have equity. You don't have a nest egg to borrow against for your child's education, to make home repairs, or pay for medical emergencies. And like the Bolton family, you miss one payment and you're evicted. There's incentive to evict the buyer so the speculator can keep all the money the family has paid and then resell the house to another buyer. Since the Boltons came to me, I've seen court records of hundreds of evictions on this model. Families on both sides are being built so that the speculators make a fortune buying low from whites and selling high to blacks. Federally insured mortgages to whites, price gouging contracts to blacks. Do you see what this is going to do to Chicago's black families and its neighborhoods? And now, through the use of a National Housing Act insured mortgage, so to answer the question that was posed in the documentary excerpt, do you see what this is going to do to Black families and their neighborhoods? The state of Inglewood today is what will happen. It's what did happen. So I want you to think about the possible reality of what Inglewood could be if those 80% of those, if those homes that were purchased on land sale contract, which was 80%, of the homes in Inglewood. Imagine if they actually had actual mortgages. Instead of having 25% home ownership today, Inglewood would more than likely still have that 80% home ownership. And so information like that, along with the presidential election year of 2016, where Chicago was in national headlines for its gun violence, of course, our current president zeroed in on the neighborhoods that were impacted most 
by gun violence and talking about he was going to send in the feds to Chicago. I mean, he's actually talking about that now too, but he did in 2016 and 2017. And I just got frustrated myself along with a lot of other residents in Inglewoods and, and in neighborhoods like it. We just felt that was coded language for the black neighborhoods in Chicago are horrible and messing up the city. And now we had a presidential potential who was shining a light on it. And so I got tired of the conversation only being about gun violence. When gun violence is truly the symptom of this tragedy that happened within Inglewood with land sale contracts, discrimination. And I wanted people to understand the larger context. And so that's what encouraged me to finally create and start working on the project that would soon become Folded Map. I thought about that train ride to high school. I thought about the friendships that I had in high school. I thought about how I got to know so many other neighborhoods in Chicago because of those friendships. And I realized that the key to understanding anything and specifically a location is you have to talk to people who live there. You have to have a relationship. And so I began thinking about those streets that were the same in Inglewood that extended all the way north. And I imagine if you were to fold Chicago's map at its zero point, which is Madison Street, the neighborhoods that would touch Inglewood would be some of the neighborhoods that I had grown to love on the north side. The neighborhoods that would touch Inglewood would be Edgewater, Andersonville, and the lower part of Rogers Park. And so I photographed addresses that were similar on those same streets that I had remembered from high school and that I had been to throughout my life since. This is 6900 North Ashland, 6900 South Ashland. The bus stop, the South Ashland is a huge major intersection. Some of you all might be familiar with the North Ashland. That, that's a small intersection. But the South Ashland bus stop has never had a bench or a bus shelter in my entire life. This was the bus stop everyone hated. You can imagine it in the wintertime. So now I'm gonna play for you a clip of those two intersections side by side. This video was also included in Folded Maps exhibition. And I just want you to think about what pops out to you the most. I just want you to make a mental note of some of the differences that you see. So of course, I photographed addresses, homes that were uh, same address, similar address on the same street, 6330 North Polina, 6329 South Polina. If you notice the South Polina address, not only has vacant lots and a vacant home, but it also has people who still live on that block. And this is what they have to tolerate and accept. Whereas 6330 North Polina, everything is fully flourishing to the point where homeowners are proud and have an American flag. 6720 North Ashland and 6720 South Ashland. As you can see, 
The primary difference is, is how the facade of the building looks, how the sidewalks, there's a board, like a unfinished gate of some sort or the South Ashland. All of those differences from the North Ashland address have nothing to do with gun violence or residents. It has everything to do with the allocation of city services. So of course I was photographing people, uh, phot photographing homes and I eventually met people who lived in those homes. And I started to invite them to meet each other. And these are the questions that I would ask them individually and when they would meet their map twin, someone who lived on the same street, but in the neighborhood of Inglewood. How did you come to live in your neighborhood? How would you describe your neighborhood? Is everything that you need on a day-to-day -day basis accessible in your neighborhood? If not, what's missing? Is there a place of peace in your neighborhood? Why or why not? And then of course, the big adult question, how much does your house cost? How much do you pay for rent? So now I'm going to show you some of those map twins that met each other and answered those questions. Here you have the Hermitage map twins, 6400 North Hermitage residents, John and Paula Silverstein, and 5400 South Hermitage resident, Maurice Perkins. And yes, they are definitely as different as they look, but they decided and agreed to meet each other through this project. So I'm gonna play for you a clip of them answering the question of what's missing in your neighborhood. Again, I ask that you turn up your volume because this was in the beginning part of me working on this project and my audio equipment wasn't the best. So <laughs> please forgive me. type of center for the youth to kind of go hang out at or have some, some things to do when they get out of school um, or to be able to be exposed to different artistic options to um, just just kind of give them something to do um, aside kind of like hanging outside and finding different ways or, or getting into trouble. Um, but that, those trouble even being an option because to have nothing of course, it's like trouble waiting right over there, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I love, love my readers. I love yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure we could think of something, but uh, yeah. The next pair of map twins I'm going to introduce you to, um, which will be our last pair that you meet today. <laughs> 6400 North Winchester resident Bridget and her son, and 5600 South Winchester resident Carmen. I jokingly refer to them as the women of Winchester because soon as they met each other, they started complimenting each other on their haircuts, on their lipstick, on their jewelry. Um, so they really, they really became fast friends. I'm going to play for you a clip of them answering the question of how did you come to live in your neighborhood? And by this time during the project, my audio equipment had improved, so. So Bridget O'Shaughnessy, 6504 North Winchester Avenue. Carmen Arnold's friend, 6642 South Winchester Avenue. And so how did you come to live in the neighborhood you're currently in? So I was living in Edgewater before, which is a neighborhood just a little bit east of Rogers Park. And I was living in a condo at the time, and I was getting ready to adopt my son. And I wanted to have a home so that he had a backyard, and we could have a space where he could play, and also where we could live in a more diverse neighborhood, because Edgewater was starting to change quite a bit. And I picked Rogers Park because it's literally the globe. Um, and so that's, that's sort of how I found it. Yeah. I 
since purchased it in 74. So um, I've been here since 74. I haven't been here since 74, but this building has been existent in our family since 74. And once I got married, then I moved away and now I'm back after divorce. And so when you were looking for your home, was there a specific price range or price point that you wanted to stay within? So much. Um, you know, so at, it's amazing how much Chicago has shifted just in the last couple of years. And when I bought my house seven years ago, I feel like there was still um, Rogers Park was still somewhat affordable in comparison to a lot of Chicago neighborhoods. So I knew I wanted something under four hundred thousand dollars. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're like, well, hold on, okay. <laughs> and carpet. Uh, you said this building is in your family. So um, can you talk about uh, the purchase history? Do you know how much it costs? No. So, uh, I believe it's probably was thirty thousand dollars, you know. But in '74, that was a lot of money. But thirty thousand, and I think it's probably worth a lot more than that now. But never know. So, well, we do know. We know that Carmen's home today is worth about 96,000. Um, at the time that she met her MAP twin, which was a couple years ago, her home was valued at about 80 something thousand. So the 30,000 that her father purchased it for in 74, in today's dollars, that 30,000 is about 128,000. So even with the current value of her home at 90 something thousand, it means that her family still lost money on this investment because the value of the neighborhood, the amenities, all of those things contribute to how your home is appraised. And so I would like to close by showing you the first MAP twins, uh, how they have expanded the folded MAP project beyond anything I could have imagined. Um, this is MAP twin Nanette, the black woman, and the white man, Wade. They have been in contact and basically become friends since 2017. Wade and his wife, Jennifer, uh, were the first people that I talked to about Folded Map outside of my social network and invited them to meet Nanette. Just last week, Nanette posted on Facebook as Michelle Tucker, you can friend her if you like, that her, Wade, and Jennifer were starting Block Twins. Block Twins was their creation. They wanted to invite their neighbors to meet each other, to beautify a vacant home on Nanette's block. It's one of the only vacant homes on Nanette's block that everyone felt like was an eyesore. And so they invited their north side counterparts, neighbors through Folded Map to come help them beautify the building. And they shared this on Facebook. We are here on 61st and Bishop beautifying the block. We got donuts out here. Come on out. Trying to connect. Beautify. Yeah, come on out, 61st Street, 61st, we out here, Tish Cafe, Northside, collaboration. Come on out, come on out. And they're actually continuing that project this Saturday, so I'll be meeting all of them um, not far from where I stay, just some blocks away, to meet this new iteration of Folded Map as Block Twins. 
And it was my hope that through Folded Map, uh, people will understand more about what you see before you, which is residential segregation. There are the systemic forces that segregate our city that's just embedded into everything, the economics, preferences, discrimination plays a huge role, but there's the personal aspect that we're impacted with daily that we have normalized and don't even think about, our social networks, how they've been impacted by segregation. The media, we're well aware of how skewed the media reports on black neighborhoods Latino neighborhoods in Chicago. But it's so normal that we just accept it for what it is. Then also how segregation ultimately creates the lived experiences that you have. And in closing, I would like to say that overall Folded Map was literally just a platform for us to really my hope was for us to really talk about what we can do as individuals to break out of this, this system, this normalcy of segregation and start to connect with each other. And with respect to time, I am going to close up so that you all can ask questions or, or share with me what this presentation or what the project has made you think about. Thank you. Tanika, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, these concepts are really hard to break down sometimes, and most people don't know much about real estate history, much less um, sort of segregation in real estate history. So thanks so much for that. Um, I, I did want to ask if you had, uh, you know, uh, if you wanted to talk just for a couple of minutes about what you're working on now, um, feel free to share that since um, we have a couple of questions and we'll, yeah. um, we'll get to those. But yeah, I'd love to hear. And if people are interested in staying beyond seven, um, that would be great. I'm actually uh, working on a project, two, several projects actually. Um, one is called Belonging and it's focusing on uh, youth, black and brown youth in Chicago and how they experience racial profiling. Um, and it's, photos with their audio stories of moments where they have been racially profiled and how it made them feel. And I can definitely play an excerpt from one of those, but before I do that, I also want to encourage all of you all to participate in the other extension of Folded Map, which is Folded Map's Action Kit. Um, since I can't just always do, you know, facilitate Map Twins forever, uh, myself and my partner in Folded Map, Dr. Maria Creason, who's also a member of the Bungalow Association. She's on here now. Her and I have been working together to create this action kit that invites people to experience their Map Twin neighborhood through self-guided errands that we are asking them to do and then share back their experience. And some of those errands include going to your map twin neighborhood and trying to buy an organic apple. Go to your map twin neighborhood and take out $20 at an ATM. Go to your map twin neighborhood and purchase lotion. Very simple things. We want people to experience what it's like to be a resident of the neighborhood. And the purpose of that, um, of this project, is so that people can go to these different neighborhoods and not have knowing or unknowing implicit bias reinforced when they go. Because unfortunately with, you know, just human nature and as much as people have had stereotypes forced onto them to believe, um, sometimes when you go into the neighborhoods, you just only see what you have been taught and you can't break out of it. And so we're hoping that the Folded Map Action Kit is a way for people to break out of that implicit bias. And then there's also the project on land sale contracts. 
Um, I am actually documenting, photographing the homes that exist in Inglewood that are still standing that were purchased on land sale contracts. And I am hoping that this project will evolve into an exhibition where I share a collection of photos of those homes, as well as the financial history of those homes, the families who bought them, and then ultimately have one of those homes become a landmark. And the real goal is for that landmark to be used as a place where people can come and not only see art, but learn about all of these issues, maybe even have a permit folded map presentation. So instead of, you know, just doing presentations, I will be able to invite you all to come to the uh, folded map art house that used to be um, a home of one of the families that purchased it on land sale contract. And then there's several others, but I definitely would love for you all to uh, participate and receive a folded map action kit. So you can go to foldedmapproject.com and sign up to receive it. You can click on the contact or you can go to my artist website, tonikaj.com and click on the contact sheet and fill that out. And we'll be able to get your information and include you uh, in the group that will receive notification when that's ready. Great, thank you. I really wanted everyone to hear about that because that's pretty, um, who wouldn't want that? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I won't show you the belonging clip since I want to get more of your questions, so. <laughs> okay. um, I can go through some of these and it, you know, we'll get through as many as we can. We were supposed to wrap up at seven, so we'll give it like another 10 minutes or something if you're okay with that, Tanika, yeah. um, just to answer some of these. Um, uh, one person, okay, they already answered that question. Um, <laughs> thanks, Angela. Um, uh, somebody mentioned this presentation should be mandatory for the uh, Chicago City Council to view as a whole. Um, I also noticed that Eleanor Gorski had made a comment earlier about having you speak for the Department of Planning, so you can probably expect oh. to get reached out to by Eleanor. <laughs> um, it's a wonderful idea. Um, it is a wonderful uh, idea. <laughs> um, most of these are just people telling you how wonderful you are, of course. Oh. Um, one person asked, what was your favorite story that came out of Folded Map? It it's too many. It's so many. Um, well, most recently, the Block Twins. Like, I, <laughs> I, would not, I would not have imagined. First of all, Wade, Jennifer, and Nanette, they were literally my first Map Twins. So they've known each other since 2017. And I remember when they started, like, actually hanging out with each other because they actually have so much in common. They, they garden, they love craft beer, they love organic food. So it really was like a match made in heaven. And I remember when they started hanging out, I told them, I was like, you know, the project is exhibited, like you don't have to do that. And they were like, no, we love hanging out with each other. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and okay, that's fine. And for them to have maintained such a strong friendship to the point where they want to invite their neighbors to meet each other is just so heartwarming. I, I, it's an example of how not only art, but how one relationship can expand and blossom to include others, to have an experience that will help them see the world, the city, and possibly their own lives different. So that's my most recent, you know, heartwarming story. Um, one of my other ones is uh, Maurice, the young black guy who lives on Hermitage and his map twins, John and Paula. Um, Maurice, a couple years ago, shortly after they he met his map twins, he was hosting Inglewood's first Inglewood um, bike ride. And, you know, I was at the bike ride and when we were getting ready to ride off, I heard somebody yelling my name and it definitely did not sound like one of the black voices I was used to hearing. And I turned around and it's Jonathan Silverstein. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing here? He said, 
Maurice invited me. Maurice texted me and told me I should come. And he did. And he stayed and had a nighttime bike ride throughout Inglewood, two hours. And he said he had a ball. He said that he's so glad he didn't miss it. Um, he told people that he was coming to Inglewood for a nighttime bike ride. And he was like, people were looking at him crazy. And he <laughs> said that he, he was going to be so happy to tell people about the wonderful time he had. And so that was one of the first first moments that I was just like, wow, these like interactions through Fold and Map are turning into like real experiences for people uncurated by me. Yeah, just like, taking on lives of their own. Um, that's amazing. Um, uh, uh, somebody asked if the, if the land sale contracts uh, were still being done today too. And then, um, yeah. In different forms, you know, it's just, a, you know, racism, discrimination is a shapeshifter. Um, land sale contracts are, were, were made illegal um, because it was legalized theft and they, our government realized that. But there's other predatory housing practices that are going on now. Some of them are just even more hidden, um, you know, especially with everyone just finding out about Chase's recent lending history to Black neighborhoods in Chicago, that it's basically none. <laughs> so information like that is still coming out. Um, and as I begin my home ownership process again, um, I'm sure I'm going to get educated on a lot of other predatory products that are out there. So yeah, it's a shapeshifter. It's a lot going, a lot of them going on today. Yeah. Um... Uh, we have history teachers who want to get involved. We have elementary teachers who want to get involved. Um, we have someone named uh, Maria. Is Maria works with you? Yes, Dr. Dr. Maria Creason. Creason, Dr. Maria yes. Creason. So she's answering some of these questions. Thank you, oh, Dr. Thank Creason. you. See, <laughs> my partner. So yeah. she's working. She just meant to come here and listen, but now she's working. That's she got to answer. Yeah. So she's tackling that. And just uh, saying, go to your website. Um, uh, Let's see, uh, the website for the, so just to repeat, if you aren't looking in the comments, it's foldedmapproject.com in order to get those kits. And tonikaj.com. But what I'll make sure I do, I'll send you, Carla, the, the information and, and maybe you can just, you know, share that with not only the people here tonight, but, you know, the association if they want to get involved. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, I think that's most of what we had. Um, are you still introduced? So are you still, I was just curious, introducing map twins to each other at all? Are you still getting, and are you still photographing doing the map twins thing? Or are you kind of letting that do its thing while you're moving on? Yeah, I, yeah, I know you're busy. Sadly, I had to end it. I am actually wrapping up um, the last pair of map twins um, footage that represent the western side of the city because as i said i went to high school and met a lot of west siders and they pulled they pulled my coattail and they said how are you going to have a project about equity and you leave out half the city you don't include the west side <laughs> i was like okay i'll do a map twin that represents the west side so the last map twins represent logan square and garfield park because it is still a north-south divide. So a lot of people assumed that I would do east-west, which I could to represent the west side, but I wanted people to understand the geography of Chicago's segregation and to know that the western side of the city experiences segregation like more concentrated than north and south. You have to go 45 minutes before you notice the difference. Whereas on the Western side of the city, you go from Fullerton to Madison, and that's just really about 10, 15 minutes. And you notice the complete difference in the neighborhoods on some of those Western streets. So I definitely wanted to include a pair of map twins that represented that, which I'm very glad that I did. Um, I'll be uploading their video and sharing that on social media, but uploading the video to Folded Maps website uh, within the next couple months. 
And it is the first pair of MAP twins uh, that was able to talk about gentrification um, because that unfortunately is not how segregation has played out on the north and south side neighborhoods. It's definitely something that the western side of the city has experienced the most. Um, and they had an amazing conversation about their thoughts and views on gentrification, some that really surprised me. So I am excited to be able to share that. But that was the last pair of Matt twins. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah, I saw, I, again, I saw you in 2018 talking about this. So it's been a lot of talks, I know. Um, it's just such a great like project, um, but it's 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 hard to not want to keep hearing you talk about it. But uh, <laughs> um, but I might end up change and, and and do another pair in another year. Like you know, it's yeah. hard. it's fluid. It's you know <laughs> reasonable. Yeah, um, I even saw there was even a play about this that I went to go oh, to play, yeah. which was in I think Wicker Park, right? And one of the first things that was asked was like, where, what neighborhood is everybody from? And yeah. like, and it was, what was amazing is like, ev I mean, so many neighborhoods were represented and I didn't really know what to expect at all with the play and stuff. It was blown out of my chair. It was so good. And the fact that you had so many people from so many different neighborhoods there was just like, I've just never seen that before, you know, and like a theater. Yeah. Like, and I think something. that, you know, the reason that I love doing fold and map presentations and, and allowing it to spin off into these other mediums that I never would have imagined is because, you know, although we've normalized segregation in Chicago, we don't have um, enough visibility uh, showing the integration that does occur and, and, and how it occurs. And yeah. so it leads us to believe that, you know, we don't, we don't want integration or it leads us to believe that, you know, we're always just deeply segregated from each other and, and we never get to highlight those spaces or events or moments where integration does occur. And so that's why it really um, is important for me to be able to do those expansion projects of Folded Map, like the Folded Map play, um, because it does allow people a moment to be around different people from different neighborhoods. Yeah, the questions are great. I mean, they were just amazing too. Um, well, I want to respect your time. You've already given us more than what you uh, were supposed to. So thank you so much for this. Again, um, foldedmatproject.com and tonikajphotography.com. Is that correct? It's tonikaj.com, but when you go there, because I got two website names that's linked to it. So, so okay. Tonika Photography, that's an old one. Okay. But tonikaj.com. Okay or foldedmap.com. Great. Thank you again. Um, you this was welcome. fabulous. Have a great night, Tanika. And thanks everybody for, for logging on tonight. We hope you enjoyed it. If, and again, we'll send you all, anyone who signed up where we have your email address, um, we're going to send you a recording from tonight too, so you can show everybody else. All right. Well, thank you. Bye, everybody.